Leaving Zuland, we cross a country of rugged, majestic ranges and come to the bridge of the world. Here is the source of the Orange River, that grim waterway of the nations, so often reddened with the blood of slaughtered armies. Another stream arising here empties into the Indian, while the Orange empties into the Atlantic. Continuing hinterland, we follow the course of a river which mirror-like reflects in its deep, calm depths the kaleidoscopic pictures fringing its banks. In a moment, we pause on the trail of the great park finder, Dr. Livingston. The native name for Victoria Falls is Sounding Smoke. Here, the mad waters of the Zambezi plunge over the declivity 445 feet in a cataract a mile and a quarter wide, flinging its weeping spray in the brilliant light of the African sun. It disturbs one to reflect that so much beauty and grandeur have through the centuries been displayed to only now and then a lonely mortal. When Nero fiddled to the burning of Rome, these same waters played the same dirge, and the symphony will cease only with the end of time. Beyond the Victoria Falls, country becomes more inaccessible. Many and varied are the experiences of the trail. Sometimes we would be stuck for hours or days in a mud hole or some drift like this one. But what do we care? Where night falls, we can. All is well with the world. In the very heart of Africa, on the borders of Gola, is the Kunaini River and the falls of Urahokanar. It is December now, the dry season. With the coming of the rainy season in January, the Cascades become one mighty cataract, covering the entire face of the cliff for three quarters of a mile. We are the only Americans who have ever looked upon this masterpiece of nature. Coming up through these primeval forests, we were the object of great curiosity to the jungle. Whenever you see a rhinoceros in the water, it is always a hippopotamus. If I were a hippo, I'd want to live in the placid pools beneath the Orohokanar. The jungle abounds in game. There is the warthog prehistoric progenitor of our domestic pig and innumerable ham sandwiches. Chance of a choice morsel is the reason for this friendly visitation. While the safari boys are cooking their evening meal, it is being supervised from the gallery. The story of man's life without a description of his animal neighbors makes an incomplete picture, for man is always interested in animal life, whether for food, clothing, or sport in the chase. The animal stories of the race never lose their fascination, and the animal folklore of the world has charmed mankind in all ages. Watch the little mother as she takes her baby for a buggy ride. The baboon is classified among the old world apes and is closer to the anthropoid ape from which some folks who monkey with the subject believe that we ascended or descended dependent on the point of view. They are well organized in their community life and go on protracted expeditions, which enterprises are always discussed beforehand and the proper leaders appointed. In the line of march, they have scouts in the rear in the advance and on both flanks. When they go to sleep at night, the guards are carefully changed about midnight. The Hottentots say that the baboons can speak if they want to, but they don't want to, because they know that just as soon as they begin to talk, the white men will put them to work. found the Zulu well advanced in the Iron Age, a pastoral, an agricultural and industrialist. The women are a valuable commodity in Zululand. They are bought for so many cows. They do all the work while the men enjoy themselves. No ch child is allowed to survive unless he is fully perfect and mentally normal. 
the eternal feminine in Zululand, the same the world over. Under the proud eyes of the great king, the horsemen pass in review, a mere remnant of an army that was once numbered by the hundred thousand. The men are gathering for the celebration. In the old military days, the men never did a stitch of work but trained for war. The women supplied the army with food. Here is the king of the Zulus, intelligent of countenance. The warriors salute their kids. The rattle of the assegai on the buffalo hide shields has terrorized a hundred nations. For many centuries, the Zulu fought his way south over 3,000 gory miles. During the wars of the great Chaka, the Napoleon of South Africa, more than a million people perished. They acknowledged the white man's supremacy only after the advent of the machine gun. In the art of fencing, they are past masters. Even a trained swordsman would be a toy to play with when fitted against the Zulu warrior. Note the agile, light physiques of these. The boys attained fiction in early youth in the art of throwing the assegai. The chief gives commands only through the Induna, not direct to his cohort. The Zulu nickname for the Induna is Amadora Nesasolit Chabila, or he who swells in the middle. This is the strut of defiance. He taunts the enemy like Goliath of Gath. Far down the path of progress up which mankind has toiled is the land of the Ovambo. Everything is carried on the head. It keeps the women graceful. The women are the only tillers in the fields. This scene suggests Millet's famous masterpiece, but there is no Angelus for these sowers of grain. These are the only mills that grind in the land of the Ovambos. The women are seen stamping the grain for the evening meal. The woman in the center takes a mouthful of water, then squirts it on her hands. Madonna of the bush belt is weaving her palm leaf mat while her child gurgles near her in a primitive bassinet. Sub Chief Takuma had married 36 wives and while we were with him, he was getting ready for the next ceremony. Standard price of a brand new wife is 10, but the ratio of depreciation is so great that a slightly used second hand bargain may often be had for only three cows. This is the roof for the lucky girl's house. Introducing Queen Kalinasha and two of her maids in waiting. A close-up of the queen showing the permanent wave of the hair and... The prince consort Haim Bili. The trophies you see represent his prowess as a butcher of bulls for his friends' feasting. The prince was arrayed in his royal robes, which consisted of two shirts and one silk hat. Husband to the queen, he pays for the privilege by being permitted to have only one wife. The prince was a jovial soul, and the celebration was held in our honor. Unlike other African races, the Ovambos have a mere semblance of a national dance. This series of jerks and kicks represent their best in the art of terpsichore. They are attended by grumbles and growls at a fanciful enemy. African peoples are very sensitive to any honor paid to them in the shape of a visit from white men. A week before we came to this Ovambo village, the governor of Southwest Africa passed through it. And in his honor, they staged one of these friendly affairs in which one man had his neck broken. During the course of the afternoon, we were afraid that some hapless fellow would get his neck broken in our honor. This is the challenge and the acceptance from the opposition. The crowd is divided into two groups. 
the side which loses must provide the ox for the feast. This national sport of the Obambos is a sort of a cross between boxing and wrestling. Each contestant tries to weaken his opponent by striking his arms before they come to grips. He proclaims himself the victor. In this scene of the Ovambo smithy, we have depicted a civilization which existed among some nations more than 2000 BC. Here is the first bellows invented by man. At first there was only one tube and later, possibly in Egypt, a second was added. The Ovambos are agriculturalists practicing metallurgy. They mine their own ore and it is smelted and forged very much in the same manner as it was at the dawn of the Iron Age. Notice the anvil on which the smith is forging. Simply a piece of iron driven into a block of wood. Our idea of the hammer has not yet fully dawned in the mind of the old bamboo. Purebreed Bushmen was like gaining the confidence of a wild thing of the woods. We baited them like you would bait an animal. Here is the fulfillment of a life's dream, our first sight of the wild men. They heard the clicking of our camera and instantly vanished. It would have meant almost certain death for us to have gone into the Bushman's country unceremoniously. In the path by the water, we laid our bait and waited. By the help of the British authorities of Southwest Africa, their frontier mounted police, and their Hottentot guides, we made the acquaintance of these people. They seem tame enough in the picture, but they are in reality among the most treacherous creatures on earth. Since we lived with them, they have killed a great many of their neighbors, and the government was up to recently attempting to round them up to stop their depredations against other tribes. They are black because their blood is mixed with that of their Ovambo neighbors. Usually they do not intermarry with other people but in the bloody feuds they have captured women, which they keep as prizes of war. In this scene of the reaction of the Bushmen to the music of the phonograph, we have a very significant phenomenon. At first, these men thought that the music came out of the air. Then they traced it down to the phonograph. Their only interpretation was that there was a man in the box Perspective mean nothing to the primitive mind. My half-breed servant explained it on this wise. He said, first the Germans had this country, then came the English. They killed many Germans. They did not eat them, nor did they throw them to the jackals to be eaten. But they put them in boxes to make music for them. The children responded even more enthusiastically than the parents. Here is another interpretation of the famous picture, His Master's Voice. We were playing a ragtime record in which the word piccanini is used. Notice how they react to the only word they understand. It is significant that the word piccanini is one of, is perhaps the only word which has survived in this country of the African native dialects. We handed this little fellow a record and told him through the interpreter that the music was on the inside of it. And then he gave us this million dollar smile in which he seems to say, go on, you're kidding me. The rhythm and intervals of the Bushman's music are so different from ours that these Stone Age flappers tried in vain to get the rhythm of modern jazz. We gained their confidence by giving them presents. Here is another covered wagon. My cameraman got these girls to blow kisses and we could not get them to stop. 
It is the first time that these men had ever seen shirts, much, much less worn ones. Here is a Stone Age barber shop. Women were first in the profession. This bronze woman of the desert is shaving her husband's head with the first razor used by man. You notice how lovely, how lovingly she applies the homemade lather to her dear husband's neck. Just a piece of flint for a razor and saliva for lather. All nations seem to have agents of games played by matching the movements of the hands. Through our Hottentot guides, we learned of this game. It is called in the Bushman language, Arinka, or the game of the fellow who wins. It consists of matching each movement of your opponent with a like gesture. Undoubtedly, this is one of the first games played by the race. Chinese, Italians, and politicians have indulged a similar pastime for ages. The skipping rope is also a very ancient pastime, dating back to the Stone Age. We found the little bush girls playing with it just as modern children do. A con arrow making is the ultimate of Bushman craftsmanship. The bow and arrow, the great forerunner of civilization, was first used in Africa somewhere around 20,000 years ago. When our ancestors in Europe were still using their rude stone weapons, the flint-tipped arrows of the Bushmen sang in every forest, on every crag and mountain spur. The deadly poison, which is found on the Bushmen's arrowhead, is made from the euphorbia, a certain succulent root of the Kalahari Desert, and mixed with a poison of snakes, usually the puff adder seen in the picture. The Bushman does not seek to kill outright, but merely to pierce the skin of an animal or his enemy. Then the poison circulates through the body of the victim and it succumbs in from one to 24 hours. The poison is boiled into a thick paste, then rubbed onto the arrowhead. Each arrowhead has a private mark so as to settle all dispute when game is killed. Test was arranged for the best bowman in camp. From birth to death, the Bushman has but one occupation. He has never planted a seed, raised a crop, or domesticated any animal, with the exception of the dog. When no longer able to shoot the bow, he is ready to die, for there are none to care for him. The girl's boyfriend has entered the contest. If he wins, she gets a first dress. If not, she will have to continue wearing sunshine and smiles. It was thought that the Bushman could not make a kill for more than about 25 yards. We placed this target at 60. The men were using their hardwood arrows, and they drove them in fully an inch. Personally, I would not care to pose for them at 60 yards. Each man knows his own arrow. Rebecca at the well, with her only domestic utensil. The shell of the giant tortoise is used by the Bushman for a water bucket. When once the animal has been wounded, then the hunter must be quick on the trail. So the sky be perfectly clear, not a vulture in sight. Just as soon as the animal begins to show the first heart spasms from the effect of the poison, immediately the sky becomes animated with the foul creatures. He is looking for the circling of the vultures, for they will guide him to where the animal has fallen. Notice the shadow of the vulture over the dead animal. When the bushman makes a kill, he cuts off a piece of the meat and brings it to the family. Afterwards, he takes the family and camps by the kill until it is all eaten. The part played by the women is to do the cooking and to dig the daily supply of roots. This is the most primitive method of making fire ever employed by the race. 
When our European ancestors first made fire, they made it exactly in this manner. The Bushmen are the champion eaters of the world. The Hottentots say that five Bushmen will eat a zebra in one night, and that two Bushmen will eat a springbok, an antelope as large as a sheep at one sitting. They have adjustable stomachs. When eaten full, they are distended, and when hungry, they fold up like an accordion. The women are not permitted to eat with the men. We ask them uh, why this prohibition, and they explain by saying, oh, because they are only women, they don't count. Now you can see why a Bushman does not have a long nose. The little children become hunters before they are weaned. They nurse until they are seven or eight years of age. They would not survive were it not for this fact because of the roughness of the food. They go along with their mothers into the bush and while the women are digging the daily supply of roots, they are hunting and making kills of little birds, mice, lizards, which they eat before they stop kicking. Little Farina brings up the rear of the hunting party. Everything in connection with the life of the Bushman is in the embryo stage of development. Here we have the dawn of art, the making of beads from ostrich eggshell. The shell is broken into small pieces, then chipped with an antelope horn, which is edged or sharpened with fire. When the discs are made, they are drilled by the woman with her husband's pet arrow. When strung on the sinew thread, they are given a final polish with a piece of sandstone and worn by the women to whom they are worth just as much as a string of pearls. A Stone Age seamstress is sewing her buckskin dress with an awl for a needle and sinew for thread. The creature which has played the leading role in the life of the Bushman is the vulture. Watching for the circling of the vultures has become the daily round and common task of a bushman's life. While he is lying asleep in his primitive windbreak, the lion yonder in the bush makes the kill, then tells it on the night winds. The bushman hearing the lion's voice gets the direction of the kill. Early in the morning he awakens at the call of the bird to go out and watch for the circling of the vultures, for they will guide him to the banquet hall of the forest where the lion has made his kill. Every flock of vultures has a king. He is larger than the rest and will not allow the common vultures to feed until he has had his fill. The kiddies are all for the dance, almost before they can walk. They learn the steps of the different animal dances. The Bushman seldom has a care and spends his life hunting, eating, and dancing. These little chaps are as happy as the days along. One of the few animals which the Bushmen hunt with the dogs is the Gemsbuck. He is such a game fighter, he is not careful to run away from his enemies. But alas, he is therefore very easily bayed. And when bayed with the dogs, then the hunters come in to make the kill. When this noble animal is hunted with the dogs and killed, the Bushman informed us that then the women may not eat of the meat, lest they become childless.
Throughout the night, the dance continues. And when it gets hot, it becomes almost as violent as the fight it is intended to portray. The participants dance until they are overcome and fall over unconscious. You have heard of the caveman. Here is the real thing. Raw, quivering, unadorned, a fair representative in culture of our ancestors of the Stone Age. He talked freely through the Becuana interpreter, telling of the uneventful things of his life in the bush. The bush folk are not only the most primitive, but also the most uniform creatures on earth. Notice the bridge with the nose without a bridge. This fellow is eating wild plums. He does not waste any time chewing, but simply swallows like a dog. The bush people belong to the yellow races of Africa. Notice the marked stetopegy of this woman, of this woman. They do not need baby buggies. The dog has been the bushman's best friend throughout his lonely life. And should the mother of a litter be killed, the woman will care for it along with her own baby. It is a custom of the bushmen when they follow in the wake of the migratory herds of game to leave the old and feeble behind them. The last act of kindness which they show is to place beside the hapless one an ostrich eggshell with a little water and perhaps a few bones. But unless he can gather wood so as to make a fire, he will not die of starvation. For that very night, the wild beasts of the desert will narrow their circles. And before morning dawns, merciful death will have intervened. This old man was captured as a boy by Hottentots and forced to a little of their language. A fortunate circumstance for us, for thus we were enabled to live with him, uh, to talk with him directly. All of his thoughts were of food and the game which he could no longer follow in the chase. He lived over for us. The ostrich stalk, a bird with a kick like moonshine whiskey and the speed of a false rumor. Nearly 20 years ago, in the very dawn of the new Stone Age, our ancestors, who are spun off as the reindeer men of Europe, used to disguise themselves like the reindeer in order to get close enough to their quarry to make the kill. And so the Bushmen also have learned to disguise themselves in the shapes of the different animals of their habitat. This is the ostrich stalk of the Bushmen about which the old hunter is now telling us and which he is living over again for us in this dramatic manner. Two men obtain an ostrich skin. One man drapes it around his body. Another walks under the wing, holding his bow and arrow close by his side. Hour after hour, they maneuver in this manner, always below the wind so that the animals cannot scent them. At last, the animals are taken off their guard. The hunters come close enough. And then the man walking under the wing shoots his feeble arrow into the body of one of the animals. And thus, this old Nimrod of the desert this little immortal of the trails lived over for us the wild experiences of his race. And here we left him, Sai, our pastoral people, and the lion is their great enemy. When the lion comes among the cattle, the herd runs for the warriors of the tribe, who come with their mighty spears to kill the king of... And the jackals have sounded the requiem of the dead.
sands of long ago covered his hillock shelter. Here's an interesting one, the Impala. Watch them jump. Look at that. Horizon. But they just trotted along a little way and stopped to look at us. king and his conqueror. After the, the blood ceremony of the Maasai, in which the young brave dips his spear in the lion's blood in anticipation of killing his own lion single-handed, at which time he is pronounced the man. Of the giants, the ceremonial dance takes place, in which both men and women participate. The Maasai are a strange folk. They never kill their cattle but bleed them, and live entirely on blood and milk. Many of the men are over six feet tall. The Morans, or the warriors of the tribe, never marry, but have certain communal rights. The backward path of man is lost here, in the shifting sands of Mother Africa's 